Good morning and welcome. We are excited about um, our launch of connection groups and Bible studies starting up this Wednesday. So Wednesday night, we're, we've got those new classes that will be starting this Wednesday, Financial Peace. we got men's and women's Bible studies, uh, some connection groups. We'd love for you to be part of a connection group because life is made to go through it together. And there's no better place to get to connected than in a, one of our connection groups. So we'd love for you to, to be part of those. So when you come up here on Wednesday night, bring the kids for Awana as Awana is kicking off this Wednesday. We want to have the kids up here, drop them off, and then go find one of those groups to go to and get plugged into. We'd love to have you do that. There's no better way to invest your time. Also, there's groups that happen there on Sunday morning. So we'll be having some of these classes starting on Sunday morning. So just look in the lobby. There are all the classes are listed out there. You can go on the church app. Look there as well for all that's listed on there. Uh, good to see everyone today, especially glad for our, our guests that have chosen to come and worship with us this, this morning. If you look in the lobby out there, we have a little bag for you that will just say thank you for coming. And then also if you want to text welcome to the number you see on the screen, we'll get some more information to you about First Baptist Church. We have a lot of ministries, lots of places that you can get plugged in and engaged with. One of those places to get plugged in is in our security ministry. So we have currently need a few more people to help uh, work in that ministry area of security. So if you'll just check at the welcome desk today after the service, let them know that you might be interested in serving on that team and someone will reach out and get back to you with that. This morning we have a special recognition. I'd like to ask Paula Oath out if she would come up here. All right, a lot of you may or may not recognize or know Paula, but actually she is our longest running employee at the church. She has she has served at First Baptist Church for 33 years. And she's not in one of the most visible positions of the church, but she's in one of the most vital positions in the church. She works back in our preschool ministry, and she has been taking care of babies and changing diapers and dealing with, with tincture tantrums and everything else for 33 years. And I don't, I don't know how you made it that long. I was ready to get through my parenting ages like that, Paula. But, and probably, and I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but when you look out there, Paula, you probably see a few uh, diapers you've changed of some of the people out here in the crowd. And um, you have been so faithful. And, and Paula, uh, you're here every Sunday, and we're so thankful for that. You're one that we can depend on. And you're one that we've been able to entrust our children to. And I've been able to entrust my children to you. And I'm so thankful that, that we can drop our children off knowing that they'll be taken care of. And we can come in here and be able to worship or go to a connection group and know that our children are taken care of. And you've been a big part of that over the years. And we are just, we are just so thankful. And we just know that that takes a lot of dedication. And a lot of people don't always see that. They just drop them off and don't know who's back there. But we know every child that you've brought through there that you've taken care of, and you've shown them the love of Christ, and we do so appreciate all that. We have a few gifts to give to you here this morning. Some flowers, and then well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for 33 years, Paul. And then here's a gift card. Here's some reason a gift for you out there, Paula. Thank you all. Again, we just want to say thank you, and we appreciate so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. About two weeks ago, we... we a group of about 11 from our church went to La Salle on a mission trip. The beautiful country, beautiful people, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to be able to let you know a little bit about what uh, God did in and through that trip. And so, uh, if you would pay attention to the screen, and just we'll show you just a little bit about what God was doing. <laughs>
there'll be other opportunities to, uh, to, do, to do missions. Hope that that's something God lays on your heart. You'll be a part of a, uh, of a mission trip up, upcoming in the next uh, months and years. So, so thankful that you're here today. We're going to ask you to stand. And we're going to ask you, don't just, don't just stand there. Don't just put your hands in your pockets. Let's celebrate him today. He's the God of all creation. He's the one that created it all. And uh, he just adores your worship. Let's stand. Let's sing from the bottom of our hearts. Let's worship. You came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. All the dead are coming back to life, back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater.
descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, until our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you there. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. Father, we just pray that you'd come and fill this place, Lord, reign in our hearts. Lord, just come and fill us up with all of that, that you want. God, we recognize that when you come and you come and fill us up, God, we've got to, we've got to in order to make room, we've got to empty ourselves, empty of ourselves of the, of the stuff and the things that don't look like you. So, God, I pray you'd help us to just do, uh, just do house cleaning in our own heart. So that you can come and you can be all that you want to be in and through us, God. We love you and we thank you. May this service bring you glory and may you bring you honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Well, it's good to be in God's house this morning. Let me say we're glad you're here, whether you're in person, whether you couldn't be in person and you're online. We're glad you're here this morning. And you know, church, I, I need this 
every week. Um, to come together and open God's word and sing collectively, uh, I, I, I literally need it. You know, G.K. Chesterton once, once put it this way. Somebody said, oh, Chesterton, I hear you're a, you're a Christian now and that you're a member of the church. And he said, yeah. And they said, well, uh, I don't even know why you go because you're such a monster. And he said, well, can you imagine how big of a monster I'd be if I wasn't a Christian and I didn't go to church? And I, I feel that, church. Are you with me? I need to be here. We need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves. But for the past two months, we've been working bit by bit through the book of Philippians. And we've seen all throughout this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, just this joy that drips off the pages. Uh, what it means to be a believer and that in Christ there is joy. Though the day may be dark, though you may be going through a difficult time, a reminder that the Christian is the only uh, person who can truly have a heart of joy um, because we know the end and the beginning, the beginning and the end, that it's all going to be well. Now as we begin this morning, I'll share a little bit of, of personal uh, information. I can remember as a young boy, uh, you know, often my parents would go to bed and uh, I would stay up reading. And I remember as a young boy uh, reading the, the Chronicles of Narnia for the first time. And if you've never read the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, it's a seven-volume fictional story. Uh, but, oh, man, it's so rich. It's so good. And in, in book two, um, the great lion, Aslan, is laid upon a stone table, and he is murdered. He is sacrificed. And I can remember that night like it hasn't been that long ago. Parents were asleep. It was quiet, you know, those kind of nights. And as I read this, this lion, who, who was a symbol of the good, the true, the beautiful, really represents Jesus. As I saw this lion murdered for something that wasn't his fault, in fact, he was sort of being killed for the transgressions of someone else, Tears just started to stream down my face. And in that moment, I thought, this isn't how the story is supposed to go. I won't ruin the story for you if you've never read it, but it doesn't end there. But I remember as an older boy, or I might say a young man, reading J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings for the first time. And in that world, it becomes a really dark place, and everything good and true and beautiful is trampled underfoot. And again, as I read that, there was this longing in me to see everything set right. And thankfully, it, it gets set right. In fact, those stories deeply resonate, resonate with me. They always have. And as a matter of fact, I often use the movies as sort of like a comfort food. Um, you know, when times are difficult for me, I do three things. I pray, I read God's Word, and I watch The Lord of the Rings. And so if my wife comes in and I'm watching The Lord of the Rings, she's kind of like, are you okay? Like, are you having a rough time right now? Of course, my wife doesn't really sound that way, but you have to give her a voice, you know. <laughs> but have you ever noticed, church, that we all have this inner desire, even if it's not spoken, or maybe you've never thought about this before, I'm sure you have, this desire to see the story end well. This desire for, for wrong to be made right. That's why when we read a book or we watch a movie or you hear a, a, a tale, there's something inside of us that longs for the story to end well. We want resolution. You know, when we, when we hear a story and someone experiences a loss, like the story of Job, you, you desire to see restoration and for things to be made right. When beauty is lost, we desire to see it regained. When someone dies or a relationship ends, we want to see their memory honored or we want that relationship to be restored. We all want good to win the day. We want the truth to prevail. We want the beauty to shine through. We want to see the darkness vanquished. We have this deep, deep desire for things to be okay and the story to end well. Now, my question is this morning as we begin is do you think maybe that's by design? Do you think maybe that's by design? Because I think we find ourselves in a story, in our own story, and our stories sort of intersect and interlap. We can be an encouragement to one another or a hindrance to one another, but we find ourselves in a story. We find ourselves in even a grander story, what some people would refer to as a meta narrative, sort of a story above all stories. Christianity is that grand 
story. And it defines all of reality. And we see these movements within that story of creation. You know, every good story has an origin story. Our story, that's in Genesis, creation. Everything is made good and beautiful and true and perfect. And then there's this fall where darkness enters the world. And right now we live in the season of grace. And one day, this inner longing that we have for all to be made right, history will culminate into this moment where glory is ushered in. To borrow from Narnia, all will be made right when Aslan or Jesus comes inside. To borrow from Tolkien, the king will return. And scripture says this, we're going to look at this this morning, that one day every knee will bow to the true king. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But currently, we live in between the already and the not yet. Christ has come 2,000 years ago. He inaugurated his kingdom, but it hasn't come in fullness yet. So we live in the season of grace between the already and the not yet when the king will return. Now, last week, we started Philippians chapter 2. We looked at verses 1 through 8. What did we learn from Paul there? Well, if you remember, we saw that the church is to be united. That in the large things we should agree, and the small things we can have charity towards one another. There's differences, I understand that. But the church should be united, and that unification should rest solely on Scripture. But we saw in, in, in this idea of unity in the church, that our example, the model that we follow, is Jesus Christ, who was humbled, who condescended, came down to our level, because goodness knows we can't go up to His took on humility, and Christ was humiliated. So what I want to do as we, as we start this morning, let's just go back and just read the verses that we saw last week because those really flow into what we're talking about today. Scripture as a whole, it all coalesces together. So if you've got your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read 5 through 8, and then we're going to talk about verses 9 through 11 this morning. And isn't it good to be here this morning? Amen? Amen. Verse 5, read with me if you will. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself, he limited himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now listen, friends. If the story ended there, oh my goodness. If the story ended with Jesus being placed in the ground and staying in the ground, all that is good, true, and beautiful would be lost. Sin, sorrow, and death would reign. But today, we move from the humiliation of our God to his exaltation. And so to begin with, if you're taking notes, we're going to talk about the exalted king. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Read it with me. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him. What we see here is the father has exalted the son. What does it say? Therefore God has highly exalted him. Whenever we see the word therefore, what do we ask? What's it? Therefore. And so the reason it's therefore, it is a connecting word. Why was Jesus exalted? Paul says because Jesus was humiliated. Humiliation led to the exaltation. And so to begin, as we think of thought, start over. So excited, I'm ready to get it out, you know. As we talk about the exalted king, let's begin with the humility principle. This is a principle you find all through the New Testament. The scripture fascinates me. Um, Not just from a standpoint of literature, but also just how it presses back so much against everything else. It's sort of another small indication that it's the right thing because it's so different than everything else. Christianity is truly a worldview that must swim upstream because it presses against the culture, presses against every other worldview. And this is why it's interesting to me is the Bible constantly teaches that to be exalted, the way to honor is through humiliation. That's so different than our culture because our culture says if you have 
the best job and the biggest bank account and the nicest car and tailored suits and you're fit, you've got washboard abs, you are to be applauded and you are to be exalted because you are in that top percent of elite human beings. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says the way to be exalted is to humble yourself and be a servant. I don't know about y'all, that's not easy because we kind of like ourselves. And we kind of think better of ourselves often than we should. But Scripture teaches, Christ teaches us this humility principle. Jesus said in Matthew 20, the last will be first and the first will be last. I think we're reminded, don't get caught up in the way that the world ranks individuals. Because sometimes I think we have this mentality of, well, you know, God, I'm just, a, speaking for me, I'm just a country boy in the city of Orange, Texas. You can't really use a little country boy in the city of Orange, Texas, but here's what I've learned. Through a mindset of humility and service, through saying, God, here I am, send me, use me how you want to, God will always use that person. Always use that person. Christians are called to be servants, to respect others, to love others, to live not for a life of applause, but to be humble individuals. And we see that model in Jesus last week. His humiliation led, led to his exaltation. So that's asked this question. Paul says, therefore God has highly exalted Jesus. How was Jesus exalted? What does that look like? How was Jesus exalted? I don't want to get five ways. There, there's probably more we could, we could talk about. But five ways that Jesus was exalted. We said last week that he emptied himself, he limited himself, he condescended down to our level. He set aside the crown and he became a suffering servant. In fact, Paul says last week, Jesus became a slave. But this week, Paul says that he's highly exalted in that he puts the crown back on. That he is exalted above all. So how was Jesus exalted? Well, first of all, I think Jesus was exalted through the resurrection. Jesus was exalted through the resurrection. Paul says, Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Christ rose triumphantly from the grave. That is what we hang our faith on. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not raised, you are just living a dream, coming to church and worshiping God because he's still on the ground. Christ was exalted in his resurrection. How else was Christ exalted? Well, he was exalted in his ascension. Again, Paul said last week that Christ left glory. He emptied himself. He came down to our level. But then you see in the book of Acts that he left this world and he was brought high again. Let me read it to you. Acts 1.9, it says, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In his ascension, he was exalted. The crown is on the head of Christ. The disciples were reminded, as we are reminded, that the king will return. No longer the suffering servant. No longer Jesus meek and mild. He will return in full glory, full regalia as a king. How else was Jesus exalted? Well, Jesus was exalted in his coronation. If you've ever seen that cinematic masterpiece, Frozen, you know what a coronation is. I hope you get sarcasm, church, you know. <laughs> hope you do. Um, you, you'll see that Jesus was exalted in his coronation. What's a coronation? It's where someone assumes the position of royalty. It's where the sovereign is crowned. Let me read to you Matthew 28, 18, familiar passage of the Great Commission. Here's what Jesus said. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. That's like all of it, right? Not just over the earth, but over all, he says. Only a king has this power. Let me, let me read that to you out of Revelation, sort of the bookend of the Bible. Revelation 4.10. 
It says, And the twenty-four elders fell down before him who was seated on the throne, and worshiping him who lives forever and ever, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, Scripture doesn't say this, but I think this is going to happen. Um, when we are able to spend eternity with Christ, we're going to do the same thing. Now, the Bible speaks of various crowns that, that Christians can have for the way that we live their lives. When we get to heaven, it's going to be cast before the feet of God, cast before the throne of the Lamb. How else was Christ exalted? Well, he's exalted as our high priest. Now, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the priest would intercede for the people to God. He would represent God to the people. And one day a year, he would offer this, this sacrifice, this atonement for the sins of the people. Now, in, his, in his, um, his exaltation, Jesus fulfills that role for us as well. He's exalted as our high priest. Listen to Jesus. This is what's often referred to as his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 4. He says, I glorified you on earth, speaking to the Father, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He's exalted as our high priest. Hebrews seven twenty six. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. You know, Scripture tells us this, that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, that he, that he intercedes for us at the right hand of God as our high priest. And also, we're reminded that Jesus atoned for our sin, which was the function of the high priest. John, the Baptist John 1, 29, it's reported that, that John refers to Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is exalted. How else is Jesus exalted? I want you to notice last he's exalted in title. Look at Philippians 2, 9 again. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, Paul, what is this title? The name that is above every name. Every name. Well, Paul tells us in verse 11 that the title that Jesus is given is Lord. Now, the the title of Lord is an allusion to the Old Testament covenant name for God, which was Yahweh. Now, it's interesting to me, the Jews in the Old Testament, they wouldn't even say the name Yahweh. You wouldn't hear it roll off their lips. Now, why is that? Because they were so fearful that they might take God's name in vain. They had this incredible respect for God that they wouldn't even say his name out of respect. Oh, how far we have fallen where the name of our Lord is constantly used in a frivolous manner. Jesus, who came as a servant, now restored as the cosmic king. Jesus is Lord, the title for royalty, the king whom is to be honored. And so we've seen that Jesus humbled himself, he emptied himself, yet through his humility, he was exalted. And we are to be reminded that is our pattern, first of all, but also this suffering servant who came in his first advent will return as the king. So let's look at that this morning. Let's look at the return of the king, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. It says, Paul writes, therefore... God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now listen to this, church. So that at the name of Jesus, Lord, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Now the New Testament authors would often use Jesus' name and Lord interchangeably. The reason for that is they wanted to fully show that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was God, that he's the king, that he's exalted above all. There is no one greater. Everyone, Paul says, will bow. Every creature will be forced to its knees. The very mention of the name of the Lord. Everyone will confess. Those words will roll off the lips of every creature that Jesus is Lord. Now, here's the big question, church. When will that be? Will we do that now 
willfully, or will we be brought low later in such a way that we would not like? Will Christ be my king now willfully? Will I submit to him? Will I confess my faith that Jesus is Lord? Will I repent? Will I be a part of God's family in time? Or will I wait till the king returns and stand before him in judgment, condemned? To quote Joshua from the Old Testament, Joshua 24. Joshua says, you know this passage, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. He says, and if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether it is the gods your father served in the region beyond the river. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So today we ask this question. Who will acknowledge Christ as king? Will we acknowledge Christ as king? The rightful king. Or will we pledge our allegiance to false gods and imposters and idols? And there's a lot of... there's. Many, many false gods, quote-unquote, beyond the river in our lives today. For some, it's money. For some, it's pleasure. For some, it's esteem, popularity. A god that our culture frequently worships at the altar of is sex. But know this, all idol worship is really worshiping who? It's worshiping me. It's worshiping ourselves. But know this, when the king returns... All will be displaced from their thrones, and Christ will sit on his throne. Let me put it to you like C.S. Lewis said it. He said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and to those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Those who seek find, those who knock, it is opened. So let me ask you this morning, have you said to God, you know what God, your will be done in my life? Are you still wrestling him for the throne of your heart? Friends, there will be a return of the king one day. And in the meantime, I see that Christians face this incredible pressure to sort of acquiesce to the culture around us. We face this pressure to sort of buckle to the mentalities and the thoughts of the culture around us. And I hear this a lot. Well, Josh, from my non-Christian friends, and sometimes from people who say they're Christians. I hear this a lot. Josh, you want to be on the right side of history, bud. You know, your, your ideas are a little old-fashioned. Um, you know, Josh, it is, in fact, a woman's choice what she does with her body. And so she, if she chooses to live cavalier, it's nothing wrong with snuffing out a life because that's her body. You want to be on the right side of history. Or I'll hear, you know, you want to be on the right side of history, Josh. Be reminded that there's nothing wrong with alternate sexual lifestyles or sex outside of marriage. You're, you're, you're going to die a battered old brontosaurus if you hold on to these ideas. Or Josh, you better remember that gender is a spectrum, so you better fall in lockstep with our culture. Because you want to be on the right side of history. Let me tell you what, church. I could care less about being on the right side of puny history. My 75 years, 80 years, who knows, maybe I'll live to 90. Imagine how ugly I'll be by then. I could care less about being on the right side of history. But I do know this, I want to be on the right side of eternity. And so what that means for me is I'm going to say Jesus is king, and I'm going to do things Christ's way. Let me tell you what, church, that's not always easy. It would be so much easier to just affirm everyone around us, to not stand on truth. That would be the easy path. But again, we talk about this frequently. We love God, and we love people enough to say, hey, you know what? We love you. What you're doing goes against Christ, and eventually it's going to cause you some problems, both now and into eternity. Christ is king. Even when culture around us is hostile to us or our thoughts, Christ is king. So what does Paul say again? Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Read it with me. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone will confess that. The living 
and the dead, the sinner, the saint, the angel, and the demon, Satan himself will be forced to bend the knee to Christ. Church, that's my king. Abraham Kuiper puts it this way. He says, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. In other words, it all belongs to God. So let me ask you this question. If Christ is king and the king is returning, the big question for us this morning is, is Jesus my king? Is Jesus my king? Let me be explicit. This is the most important question of our lives. Because if Christ is there, and he is, I believe that's what reflects reality, our decision on whether he is king in our lives affects us not only in the moment, but it affects us all the way into eternity. So this morning I ask you this question, is Jesus your king? And maybe you say, well, well, what does that even mean? How does he become my king? How does he become my savior? How does he become my Lord? Well, as we close out, let's look at two things together. Let's talk about what Jesus becoming my king is not and what Jesus becoming my king is. First, let's clear up some misconceptions. Jesus becoming my king is not baptism. You know, when the, re- when the king returns, there will be plenty of people who have been baptized but never have had a personal relationship with the Savior. They just took a bath on a Sunday morning, a quick bath, and that was it. Baptism doesn't save you. Now, is it important? Absolutely. It's an act of obedience. It's an outward symbol of an inward change. It's us identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. But it's powerless to save you outside of Christ. Jesus becoming my king is not being a member of a church. Again, there will be plenty of people when the king returns that sit in a church their whole life, but they never truly submitted and gave their lives to Christ. Jesus becoming my king is not having parents who are Christians and in the church. As the saying goes, God has children. He does not have grandchildren. It doesn't matter what your parents believe. You are responsible for yourself. Making God my king isn't believing in God. You know, church, I believe in the king of Spain. He's been, I guess, doing a great job for the past eight years. I believe in him. I've seen pictures of him. But I don't know him. We don't have a relationship. James writes in the book of James chapter 2, he says, you know, you believe in God, that's great. Even the demons believe in God. Belief is, is a part of this, but it doesn't give you a relationship with the cross. It doesn't make him your king. Christ being my king isn't a prayer that you pray. Now hear me out, there is often a prayer involved. When I came to Christ, I prayed to the Lord and we had a conversation. But sometimes people pray a prayer and the heart isn't there and it's just words. You know, talk is really cheap, church. Christ becoming my king isn't something that you can earn. You can't good your way to God. That's the whole reason Christ had to come down to our level to set aside human- his, his uh, you know, uh, experience in heaven, the divine glory. He set that aside and he came down to our level. We can't work our way up to God. So what does it mean to make Christ my King and my Lord? Let's look at it real quick together. It's admitting, first of all, that He is King. That there is a King and it is not me. There is a God and it is not me. That I am a sinner falling short and broken. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. We all have our sin nature. Jesus becoming my king is trusting the gospel, that the gospel is not just a message, it's also a person. The book of John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's trusting that who God is, who he said he is, he is, that Christ came and died for our sins, but that God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Not only is he a king, he's also a friend full of mercy and grace. What does it mean to make Christ my king? It's repenting of our sin. Coming to Christ involves repentance, that is changing our mind about who we are and what we love. Changing our our mind and our allegiance and our loyalty to say, you know what, I don't want to keep being this person. I want Christ to come and clean me up. Now, will you still succumb to sin at times? Absolutely, because we still have the sin nature. Romans 2.4 talks about the kindness leading us to repentance that God offers toward us. It's repenting of our sin. What does it mean to make God our king? It's confessing Christ is Lord, that Christ is king and I am not. I have a friend that I've known for quite a while now. He's not a believer. He believes in God. 
But he cannot lower himself to the state to say, God's your God and I'm not. He just won't do it. It's confessing Christ as Lord. Paul writes in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Again, this involves admitting, trusting, repenting, making God the Lord of our lives. What does it mean to make Christ our king? It's knowing that salvation is a gift. You can't, you can't earn it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it's by grace that you're saved through faith. This is not of your own works, lest any man should boast. We can't earn it. So this morning, church, we see this, that Jesus is highly exalted. He's the king. And Paul's emphatic that the king will return. He says this, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, church, sometimes I just need to be reminded who Christ is, that he's the king, that though he is a friend of sinners, that he's not just my buddy and my pal. We don't just chum around together. He is royalty to be worshipped, and I should take that seriously, and I should come to him with respect and humility and honor. It reminds me of this church, that on those days that are dark and difficult, that Christ sits on his throne, that nothing can get him off of his throne, can boost him off of his throne, that he is there, and that life is short, no matter what we face on the day to day. So today I ask you this question. Have you made Jesus Christ your king? Not are you a church member, not have you been baptized, not were you brought up in church, not have you prayed a prayer, but have you truly in your hearts honored him as Lord, made him your king, and that you are walking in newness of life? Because there's something in us that longs to see the story set right that longs to see the story end well. And Scripture says this, that it's going to end well, that Christ will return, the King will return. He will set up His kingdom. And those that are in Christ, not only do we get to dwell with Him into eternity, Scripture says that we become co-heirs with Christ. Do you know the Lord? Is He your King? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you so much for the ultimate pleasure of being able to be here, to worship together, to sing praises unto your name, to open your word, to be reminded that we have it good in so many ways. So sometimes we forget because some days are difficult. But Lord, on those difficult days, maybe be reminded that you're king, that you're sovereign, that you love us, that you care about us. And Lord, for those times where we get wayward, for those times where we get lax, Could we be reminded that you're our king? Could we be reminded that we should relate to you as a king? Lord, help us to serve you, to live for you, to be an ambassador to the culture around us. But Lord, for those here today that perhaps they don't know you in a personal way, I pray that today would be the day they make a decision to give you their lives. I pray that you would become the king in their heart. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We give you all honor and glory and praise. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand together.
day has been awesome. We hope this week coming up is just filled with opportunities to love people and love them. Thank you so very much for being a part. We will see you guys next week. Thank you so much. You're dismissed. If you can help with uh, chairs, we would uh, appreciate that. That's always a help to us. Thank you. <laughs>